Greta Van Fleet recently released a new album and the last track on the album is called The Weight of Dreams and it features this near three minute long guitar solo which is definitely not something you hear a lot of in music nowadays. I mean it's literally longer than most pop music singles. Now I've got the isolated guitar stems for this song and so in this video, I wanna show you some of my favorite moments from the guitar player Jake Kizka's epic solo on this song. And I wanna talk about how he builds the intensity of this really long guitar solo and still manages to make it sound memorable. The song is in the key of A minor and as a result, all of Jake's licks and phrases are working out of the A minor pentatonic and natural minor scales. The first part of the solo that I want to focus on is just the very start of it. So I'm gonna play you Jake's isolated guitar stems and then I'm gonna play it myself over a backing track and we'll talk about what's happening. <laughs> Now, this entire solo is almost three minutes long, so if you can imagine being tasked with writing a guitar solo for a song like this where you've got you know that much time to fill, you'd wanna make sure that you have a few memorable moments in those three minutes. So that means you'd probably want to repeat and develop a few licks, a few phrases, a few musical ideas in your solo because repetition and development of ideas, that's what I think uh, you know, makes a guitar solo memorable. And that's exactly what Jake does in his solo. There's a lot of examples of him repeating licks and phrases that he develops in, in various different ways as the solo progresses. And this first part of the solo is a great example of that. So he begins with this big bend on the G string, which when he picks it, he actually picks the open A string at the same time, which is not something I ever think about doing myself, but it's, you know, it sounds pretty cool. And to do that, you're gonna have to pull on the string rather than bend it up because, at least for me anyway, when I bend it up and try to get that open A string ringing out at the same time, bending up just causes me to cancel out that open A. So you wanna pick the A string, um, mute the D string with your index finger, and then also pull down on the G string to get the bend. So that's the bend, and then he plays this little motif, this little minor pentatonic phrase that appears a lot throughout the solo, and I'll just play that bit from the start so that you know what I'm talking about. Now, what I just played there, this little collection of notes here. You'll hear that a lot throughout this solo. He, he plays it a lot in between um, different melodic phrases and licks to kind of fill the space and it becomes this recurring motif. For example, in the part that immediately follows what we just went over, Jake plays a, a new melodic phrase twice and after both times of him playing that, he injects that little motif. So here's that part of the solo that I'm talking about. Again, I'm gonna play you the isolated stems and then I'm gonna play it myself to a backing track. This part of the solo, Jake is taking a phrase that he's playing uh, on the high E string, working out of position one of the A minor pentatonic, and applying that to a different set of notes on the B string. And then he almost does exactly the same thing on the G string. But 
as you just saw me play there, you know, it's a bit different when he moves over to the G string. He's doing more of a, a unison bend phrase there. And if you don't know what a unison bend is, it's basically if, you, if you're playing a bend on, let's say, the G string, say a whole step bend on the G string, which is what Jake plays there, from D to E. You pick the bend, but also you're gonna have the note that you're bending up to fretted on the B string. So the note E is right here. There you can hear I'm bending up to that note on the G string, but then also I've got it fretted on the B. And when they ring out into each other, and you add a lot of vibrato to the bend, you get this really cool sound where you're hearing two notes that are, you know, almost matched in pitch, but you know, the bend is kind of going in and out of pitch with the other one. And after he plays that, he injects that little motif that I just talked about. So we've already got quite a lot of repetition happening in this solo in just the first few bars. So let me just play what we've got so far. A bit further on in this solo, there's a passage where Jake plays a string of thirds on the D and G strings that move up and down the fretboard. So here's the part that I'm talking about. <laughs> So basically what's happening here is Jake is harmonizing the A natural minor scale on the D and G strings simultaneously, which means that for the notes on the D string, on the G string, we're playing notes that are a third higher than those notes. So the first third is here. So notes A and C. So if I play from A to C within the A natural minor scale, counting A as the first note. One, two, three. There you can see that those notes are a third part and it's exactly the same deal for all of the harmonized notes that you hear in that section. And Jake plays these thirds twice in a couple of different ways. So I'm just gonna play it again for you so that you can hear the difference. So there is some development going on there as well because he's playing, you know, two very similar things, but he's just kind of switching up the order of the notes the second time that he plays it. So the first time we start on this. The second time it's this. At this point in the solo, everything has been around this same position, but once you get past the halfway point and progress towards the end of the solo, you'll hear Jake move higher and higher up the fretboard. And 
what he does to build the intensity of this solo as he's doing this and you know develop it in a cool way is he starts playing a lot of the phrases that you heard him play at the start of the solo uh, down here he takes them and starts playing them an octave higher so let's listen to the isolated tracks to hear that So he's reintroducing this. An octave higher. I believe he plays that four times before he reintroduces another phrase that we've already heard him play, but again an octave higher, and that's this. And I really like how he's done that because not only has he saved, you know, the highest notes for the, the most climactic point of that solo, but he's also like recycled phrases and licks that he's already played at the start of the solo. So he's playing things that already sound familiar to you, but just in a different way, just doing it an octave higher. And of course, he's ending the licks in slightly different ways um, each time that he plays those phrases. But for the most part, you know, you recognize those phrases. That's not where the solo ends though. After that, he launches into this big repeating lick that he plays a bunch of times. And then he ends up with some big screaming bends way up at the top of the fretboard around the 22nd fret. So here's what that part sounds like. So it's a pretty intense guitar solo that gradually builds and builds in intensity as he develops it. And what can we learn? What can we take away from analyzing a solo like this? Well, the first thing that comes to mind for me is that it's totally okay to play the same licks and play the same phrases twice or even multiple times. There are so many examples in this solo of Jake repeating ideas and phrases and licks in numerous different ways, but you can tell that he's clearly making an effort to do that. It's a very deliberate thing that he's doing there. It's like you can tell he's making an effort to make this almost three minute long guitar solo sound memorable. And like I said at the start of the video, repetition and development of musical ideas, that's how you write a memorable guitar solo in my opinion. Sometimes you do hear guitar players play the same thing twice or multiple times and you can tell when it's not a deliberate thing, you know, sometimes it is just the case that the guitar player uh, has run out of ideas and doesn't know what else to play. I know I've been there myself on stage many times, but you can tell that that's not the case here. He's, you know, making a deliberate effort to do things like replicate the, the way that he opened the solo towards the end of it, but an octave higher. He's doing that to build the intensity and develop you know, a memorable guitar solo. And another thing that we can learn from looking at a solo like this is that starting low 
and finishing high is always a good way to approach building a solo that calls for a big climactic finish. Because if you start shredding all the way up here and play your most intense, you know, emotional, um, melodic phrases right at the start of the solo and then you're left with nothing else for the, for the rest of it and you just sort of end down here, that's probably not the best way to do it. Chances are it's gonna sound quite flat finishing your solo down here as opposed to if you just started down here, gradually build that intensity and develop your solo so that it ends high up the fretboard. Because I always think that, um, you know, the higher up you are on the fretboard, um, the more, I guess, emotional and melodic your phrases tend to sound if they're played up here versus down low. So start low and finish high if you're writing a really long guitar solo that needs a nice big finish. Guys, thank you so much for watching today's video. I hope that you enjoyed it. And if you did, please click the like button and subscribe for more content like this in the future. And I hope to see you in the next one.